Hallelujah. Y'all feel better now? I see some smiling faces out there. Y'all feel something good this morning, all right? Lord, the devil, y'all pray for me. The enemy trying to get in my throat this morning, but I refuse to let him have that, that glory. God gets the glory this morning. Hallelujah. Man. We're going to move on to the next portion of service. And we thank God for you all. For everybody that is here this morning, y'all give yourselves a round of applause. Y'all look beautiful this morning. It's so good to see so many beautiful smiling faces in the house of God this morning. Hallelujah. Good man. Amen. Good morning. I'll be reading for you the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I will be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. And you will find these words recorded. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for the length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and of man. Trust in the Lord. I'm going to read that one more time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. God's word for God's people, amen. amen. New Testament, Romans 8. Verse 24 through 30. In it you will find these words recorded. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we, that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. God's word for God's people. But your word say, I don't know what to pray for anyway. 
and I ask that your spirit empower me to do this and to take control. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for the privilege of another day's journey. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And I say thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your unfailing love, Lord. Thank you how you took us out and brought us back in throughout the week, oh God. Kept us safe, oh God, and protected us, oh God. And then, Father, you're so good, you provided for us, oh God. Thank you for the simple things of life that you've blessed us with, oh God. Don't always has to be big things, but just the simple things of life. Thank you, Lord. And Father, as we gather in this wishing service this morning, I know you're already here. Feel your presence, oh God. But thank you for the joy of being in your presence, oh God. Thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding, oh God. And thank you that we have peace with thee, oh God. Help us to trust you and to lean not upon our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge thee and let you direct our path, oh God. We need you. We know of no other way. Jesus said, I am the way. And thank you, oh God, for Jesus. He shed blood that he shed that we have forgiveness of sin. And I ask that you forgive us of our sins, oh God, in your name, oh God. And Father, thank you for this great salvation that he's provided. And Father, oh God, if anybody in this congregation this morning who don't know you personally, oh God, ask that you move upon their hearts, oh God, that they will come to know you as Savior and Lord, oh God. Thank you this morning, Father. Thank you for grace that came by Christ Jesus. Thank you for your many blessings and your many benefits, oh God. And now, Lord, I ask that you bless the preach man of the hour, oh God. Ask that you empower him to teach and preach this morning your word, oh God. And thank you, oh God, for giving us a preach, preacher according to your heart who will feed us with understanding and knowledge, oh God. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for everyone who's present here this morning, oh God. And we ask your healing upon the sick among us. Many are. But I know your Father personally as a healer. Because one day, you touch this body of mine, oh God. And I only stand here, Father, in your grace and in your mercy and in your strength. And I say hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, we ask your blessings for this service. For it is in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.
good to be alive praise God again good morning this is the day the Lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it how many of y'all glad to be in the house of the Lord today praise God again and to all of uh, to all of you who uh, may be uh, supporting uh, breast cancer awareness month and day and to all of our survivors amen we do greet you this is a special time for me <clears throat> my both of my grandmothers had breast cancer and had breast removed um, my my auntie had breast cancer and my first cousin who we were raised as brother and sister died from breast cancer uh, so this is a day that we reflect amen, amen. and to also uplift the seriousness in our community uh, of making sure that we're being amen uh, that we're being seen uh, by the doctor and make sure that we stay up on that amen? amen you know all that you have in life and I'm reminded sometimes we're neglectful really one of the main important things you have in life is your health you can have a million dollars but if you're not healthy you won't enjoy it and it's critical for us in our community and I've been part of the problem in our community to stay up on our health amen get your checkups ladies get your checkups I tell my daughters all the time because of the history of breast cancer in our family make sure you're getting checked up and men can get breast cancer as well amen are there any survivors in the house of breast cancer we want to would you just stand y'all can we just give them a great big hallelujah thank you Jesus now come on up come on up front come on up front Come on up front. I want, I want to take a picture. Oh, we can do better than that. These are survivors. Hallelujah. These are survivors. Amen. Where, where are the Sister Yvette? Come on up. Sister Yvette, come on up. And those who have planned this day, amen. Amen. Come on up. I want to take a picture. Uh, Lily and I with the survivors. Amen. Amen. How many of you can wave a hand and say, I'm a living testimony of the goodness of God. Hold on, y'all. Play some good picture-taking music. This is, this is, and thank God that I was asking them the number of years they were survivors. It's just amazing that what God can do in the lives of those who will trust him. Praise God. This is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we do know in our community that is a problem. A amen. So we want to support our domestic violence um, agencies, uh, and those who are working our shelters, and those who are working... Uh, against that as well amen don't this is just from pastor now don't stay nowhere amen. where somebody needs to lay hands on you 
Now I know that's a more difficult situation because there's mental abuse that goes along with that. But I guarantee you one thing. <laughs> you lay hands on me, I'm gonna be the last one. I'm not gonna have you talk to your neighbor today, but tell your neighbor, I'm gonna be the last one. You are too important to God and too special and too valuable to put up with emotional abuse, verbal abuse, mental abuse, and physical abuse. Amen. And if, if you need, if you are in that and you need to get out of it, there are resources. Amen. Do I have any domestic abuse survivors? Amen. Praise God for you. Thank God. I know everybody can't say that, but I want, to, I want people to see that there are survivors and you can overcome that. Thank you, sister. You can overcome that in the name of Jesus. Reach over and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I am somebody and won't nobody put hands on me. Tell your other neighbor, I know who I am. You can't talk to me any kind of way, treat me any kind of way. We ain't preaching yet. Praise God, praise God, praise God for that. That is a horrible, horrific thing. Men, there should never be a reason you put hands on a female. Pause, rewind, and play. There should never be a reason you lay hands on a female. And we need to teach our young boys that. Amen. Even if she lay hands on you, be a man. Amen. Be a man. Somebody say, be a man.
came to love me so. He looked beyond. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My faults and, and so. to invite your intellect and summon your senses to <clears throat> second book in the Bible, the book of Exodus. <clears throat> that word Exodus is an old Hebrew Aramaic word that means exit or to be removed. Exodus chapter 1 <clears throat> is there that the Holy Ghost is highlighted for us context of scripture beginning at verse 22 when you have it would you stand with me in the presence of God Exodus chapter 1 <clears throat> verse 22 your Bible should read, Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, all right, all right. and every daughter you shall save alive. Would you skip over to chapter 2 and verse 1? <clears throat> Your Bible should read, And the man of the house of Levi went and took as a wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and lay it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked alongside the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. <laughs> so she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. <clears throat> then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. I want to use for a subject dealing with a basket case. Dealing with a basket. And yes, I feel like preaching. <clears throat> Praise God. Amen. Yeah, y'all come on in. I understand. Amen giving birth and dealing with a basket case. Ladies and gentlemen, the story goes of a little boy <clears throat> who just received a brand new toy sailboat <laughs> so he could play with it in the pond in the backyard. On this day, the father brought the son a little toy sailboat to play in the pond in the backyard. The boy was so happy to get this new toy sailboat that he rushed his father in putting it together so he could rapidly go play in the pond. When the sailboat was ready, he ran to the pond. He put the sailboat in the pond and pushed it as hard as he could out to the water. It was then that a gust of wind came and sailed the boat far out of the reach of the middle of the pond 
the little boy became frantic and began crying loudly because he could not reach his new sailboat, which had sailed away from him because of the wind. All right, all right. <clears throat> Suddenly, his older brother came running out of the house to see what his little brother was crying about. And when the boy pointed, pointed to the boat, the older brother grabbed several large rocks and began to throw them in the direction of the boat. The little boy screamed for his brother to stop throwing rocks at his brand new sailboat. It was then that the older brother said, I'm not throwing rocks at your boat, but I'm throwing rocks just over your boat. It won't hit your boat, but the ripples the rocks make on the other side will bring the boat back to you. Just when the boy released the boat and lost it in the water, his boat came back to him in a way that he could not have imagined simply because the older brother made ripples in the water. All right, all right. That helps us, ladies and gentlemen, to the discipline of the discourse of our text today. Here is a woman in Exodus chapter 2 who releases something in the water, loses it, but by the power of pro the providential God, receives it back in a way that she could not have imagined because God created providential ripples in the water to bring her blessing back to her. The mother in this text gives us our thesis lesson at the outset in that sometimes you can have what you want, but you have to re release what you have. I'll try it again. Sometimes you have to release what you can't keep Amen. in order to get what you can receive. Right. In chapter 2, we introduce to the mother of the most significant figure in the Old Testament, Moses. Her name is not mentioned in chapter 2 initially, but we finally discover in chapter 6 that her name is Jochebed. Her name is not mentioned in this chapter, but her name, ladies and gentlemen, carries the weight of significance of the relevance to all events. There is no Moses without Jochebed. That means there is no exodus without Jochebed. There is no deliverance of the Israelites into the wilderness and ultimately into the promised land without Jochebed. That means that the entire history of the Israelites as God's chosen people to bring salvation to the world ultimately culminating with the birth of Jesus Christ, hinges on one act by this lady named Jochebed right, right. and saving her child Moses. Moses is the chosen deliverer of God's people. Well. Moses was born with a predetermined destination. All right, all right. As a matter of fact, Moses was born with a prenatal destiny. Before his birth, he is the chosen one. And God's calling is on Moses pre-birth. Moses will be the one found in Midian by God after hiding from murdering an Egyptian and God calling him in a burning bush. Moses will be the one sent to declare liberation of Israel from Pharaoh after 10 plagues sent by God by telling Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses will lead Israel through the Passover into the wilderness and after 40 years lead them until they come into the promised land. Right. Moses' life ends in Deuteronomy, but not until God's calling on his life is fulfilled. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing that shouts out at us about this text is that you're not going to die until God's promises and purposes are fulfilled in your life. I'm going to try it again. You're not going to die until God's promises and purposes are fulfilled in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, God does not work after death. Death works for God. The Bible says, naked I came into my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord giveth and the Lord 
taketh away. You are not going to die until God's purposes and promises are fulfilled in your life. I'm trying to talk to somebody who is a living testimony that you should have been dead and gone. And the reason why breast cancer didn't take you out, the reason why that stroke or aneurysm did not take you out, the reason why you have not stroked out or had a heart attack and dropped dead yet is because God's calling and purposes are not fulfilled in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try it again. The first thing that shouts out about this passage is you are not going to die until God's promises and purposes are fulfilled in your life. The purpose was established before Moses was born. So therefore, it has to come to pass before he dies. No one understands this better than Moses who himself wrote Psalm 90 where he says the years of our life are 70 and even by reason of strength they are 80. Yet the span of our life is full of trouble. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. It says that we have a time span and a purpose that is given by the wisdom of God. I am here for a reason. I am here for a purpose. I have a prenatal calling. That's why Jeremiah said uh, that God told him before I was conceived in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nation. Well, if I'm born to be a prophet to the nation, then I'm not going to die until God's prophecy is fulfilled in my life. That means that you are alive for a reason. I would have you tell your neighbor something, but I'm going to keep you from telling your neighbor. But somebody just shout, I'm alive for a reason. I am here because I am God's choice. I need somebody to wave their hand and say, I am God's decision. I am God's choice. I'm not dead yet because God is still using me. He still has purpose. Oh, wait a minute. There's a preach right there. For those of you who got your heads down with all your little low self-esteem and walking around all discouraged and depressed I got a word from you straight from the hot presses of heaven that God still has a purpose in your life I can't do it Lily would you tell your neighbor say neighbor I got something left is there anybody here that can testify I've been to hell and high water I've been through it I've been over it and when now I come into friendship on Sunday morning I'm going to let the devil know he didn't kill me he didn't take me out he didn't take me under am I preaching to anybody that can testify no pastor you talking to me right now and I can testify that I am a living breathing walking talking testimony and as long as I am alive I'm going to use what I got left do I have about 20 people I'll make 21 who can testify. I'm going to use what I got left. They didn't steal everything from me. Would you tell your neighbor they didn't take everything from me? I still got my right mind. Is there anybody I feel like preaching? I told you I feel like preaching that can testify. Look, I don't have a million dollars in my 401k. I'm not fronting like I even make a million dollars a year. But what I do have is my right mind. High five your neighbor and say, neighbor, the devil didn't take my mind. I ain't crazy. I ain't lost all my sense. Don't get it twisted because I ain't saying nothing. I know what's going on, but I'm just thankful to God that in spite of everything, I can still stand, I can still see, I can still shout and I still got my sense. Pause, rewind, play. I can still stand, I can still see, I can still shout and I still got my sense. Tell your neighbor I'm crazy but I got sense and I got sense enough to know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side And I'm not going to die. The devil is a lie. Gone too soon is a lie. Ain't nobody ever gone too soon. They are born with a purpose. They live with a purpose. And they die with a purpose. And it is appointed for man. 
Somebody say, I'm appointed. Since this calling precedes his life, it has to precede his death. <clears throat> that means God's promises that precede your life, ladies and gentlemen, are so strong that the purposes on your life are stronger than your challenges. If Yochebed does not save him in the way that she does, history will be severely altered. That name Yochebed is a combination of two words. It is Yah and Kabed. Yah is the Hebrew name for God. Come here, class. That is the root of the word Yahweh. Kaved is the Hebrew word for glory. Hence, her Hebrew pronounced name means Yahweh is glory or to the glory of God or to God be the glory. The son she gave birth to has to be given a prenatal calling. She has been given a postnatal prophecy that God will get the glory out of her life and the birth of her son. Because Hebrews were names were pronounced as prophetic on the lives of children by the parents. They're only given after eight days of prayer and fasting by the parents upon what their name is. They are careful not to name their kids Hennessy. Or Carvassier. Or Sirach. They fasted. Y'all quit. Don't play with me. They fasted. And prayed for eight days because they believed that the name you gave to a child woo, was prophetic. Y'all ain't feeling me. Y'all, my name is Jared. The name Jared means successor. Y'all will get that one on the way home. When they name me, they know I would be succeeding somebody. We're past the being at who can shout. I'm glad for my successor. Somebody say, I got a calling on my life. They fasted. They prayed for eight days, fasting and priestly counsel. And after that, the prophetic reference is that she would have life experiences that she will have to endure, but for God to get the glory. It's pronounced over her life, ladies and gentlemen, that God will get the glory. Whenever your life is dedicated to God, God will always get the glory for your life experience. And we know that all things work together for the good to them who love the Lord and are called according to those who have a purpose on their lives. God does not just get the glory from victories in life. He also gets the glory from the trials of life. Don't you know that you have been through what you have been through in life for God to get the glory? That means if God put you through something to get the glory before you were ever born, God put you through it. And if God put you through it before you were born, that means during your life he brought you through it. And the reason why he brought you through it was for him to give the glory. How dare you sit on your testimony and be silent about what God brought you through? No. Is there anybody that can testify to God be the glory? For the great things he has done. That's when you clap back at your enemy. When you look and say, I'm glad you actually put me through it. I'm glad I had to endure you for God be the glory. I've been broke, busted, and disgusted. But to God be the glory. I built with some knuckleheads and chicken heads. But to God be the glory. I was fired off of my job for no reason. But to God be the glory. Is there about 20 people? Why y'all playing with me? I'll make 21 who can testify when I look back over it all. I got to say to God, be the glory for all that he's done for me. Many of you today have found yourself giving God glory for the things he has brought you through. And the things that have turned out in your favor because of him and every now and then God will put you through something pull you through bring you out and when he does the only thing you can say is nobody but the Lord I don't know if we're gonna make it through this one today I'm gonna try but do I have any nobody but the Lord testimonies is there anybody in the middle that can just tap your name and say wait a minute man it wasn't nobody but the Lord I don't have to give you all the details I don't have to play out the scenario I ain't got to tell you who it was what they did but what I would tell you is nobody but the Lord 
That's when I look at my beautiful wife sitting in service. I got to tell God, nobody but the Lord. Is there anybody that can testify what God has for me? is for me and I'll give him the praise and give him the honor and I will give him the glory would you reach over and tell your neighbor say neighbor it's my story but it's God's glory and everything I've been through is there anybody here today that can confess I never would have made it without the Lord there are some things I'm still dealing with, some things I'm still struggling with, some things I'm still wrestling with, I'm still fighting with. We haven't come through everything, but what we have come through, you ought to be able to tell the Lord, thank you. Walk with me for a moment through the context. <clears throat> 430 years prior to this text, Jacob later renamed Israel by God and his family had gone into Egypt and escaped the famine in Palestine. Jacob's youngest son Joseph had come back to Egypt and revealed himself to his 11 brothers who left him for dead in a pit years earlier over the jealousy of his favor with Jacob who gave him a coat of many colors. Can I tell y'all the story? After surviving the pit and the prison in Egypt, because of his gift of dream interpretation, Joseph found favor with Pharaoh and becomes the prince and prime minister of Egypt and requested that his father and brothers come to Egypt, which the family did and enjoyed prosperity as long as Joseph was in power. As the years passed after Joseph died, a new king arose in Egypt and the king, the scriptures said, did not know Joseph. This king observed that the Hebrew people were now growing in numbers. They came over as 13, but now they're growing in numbers. And fearing that they might soon outnumber the Egyptians themselves, this new pharaoh began seeking ways of population control. Reducing the number of Hebrews and keeping them in subject to Egyptian authority, this new pharaoh reduced the Hebrews to slavery. He robs them of their liberties and he puts them to work in brickyards as cruel tax masters. And at the time the account opens up in Exodus chapter 2, the condition of the children of Israel was severe oppression. Exodus chapter 1 verses 10 through 14 describes the hardships that are placed upon the Hebrew people. Their lives were made bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in many kinds of field labor. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 14 concludes by saying all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor and toil and labor. Even this severe treatment did not serve to decrease the number of children of Israel because no matter what Pharaoh did to them, they didn't die, they multiplied. They kept on growing in, Israel, in Egypt. Pharaoh was incensed because he could not stop them increasing in numbers. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, in desperation, the Egyptian king initiated the first record of genocide in history and decreed that every male child born to the Hebrews should be cast into the river. It's at that time during the genocide that Moses was born to Amram and this woman named Jochebed. He should have died at birth but lived to see God's calling fulfilled on his life. Moses' entire life is a living testimony of the goodness and favor of God. In Exodus chapters 1 and 2, there is terror among the midwives. The mothers and the families and midwives are terrified of the Hebrews who are in slaves in Egypt. When Moses, her youngest child, was born, ladies and gentlemen, Jochebed hid him for three months until the text says she could hide him no longer. To save her son's life, she waterproofed a basket and put the baby in the waterproofed basket and closed it. Jochebed places Moses in a basket and released him into the flow of the river Nile. This basket fell into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter who was bathing in the river. Moved with compassion, when she discovered the child, she decided to adopt 
the crying baby. The sister of the child, Miriam, who had come forward, suggested to find her a Hebrew woman to nurse the child. Y'all, this is good drama. Pharaoh's daughter agreed, and so Miriam called her mother, who was appointed to take care of him. Thus, Yochebed nurses her own son without the knowledge of Pharaoh's daughter until it was old enough and brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son y'all that's the story let's back up and deal with some dramatic issues in the story and then we'll go get some shrimp ladies and gentlemen the first thing we see is the hiding of the baby there is a genocide and they are looking for the firstborn Hebrew boys. I'll try it again. There is a genocide and the army is looking for the firstborn Hebrew boys. Verse 2 says at three months the baby is becoming harder to hide. Egyptian soldiers are randomly and consistently checking houses daily for newborn soldiers sons in this densely crowded population crying babies would be easy to detect and we know Moses was crying because when she put Moses in the water he shows up to Pharaoh's daughter she opens the basket and the baby is crying tell your neighbor we know the baby's crying to make matters worse, the Egyptians have informants among the Hebrews to snitch about the location of the firstborn sons. And so now for three months, this situation is too difficult for Yochebed to hide. For three months, she could juggle it, she could manage it, she could handle it. But now hiding this crying baby is becoming too difficult with all the snitches. And all the random checks and the sound of crying is becoming too challenging for her to muffle in the little hamlet where she's raising this young baby. Ladies and gentlemen, a good sign that you're beginning to have a basket case is when the situation is becoming more and more difficult to maintain. Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, her anxiety? Maybe I don't know the next crying or the next random check at odd hours would reveal that she has been hiding a baby. Maybe the baby is teething or maybe the baby has colic or maybe the baby's running a fever like any other baby. Maybe the baby cries when it actually gets hungry or cries when it needs to be changed. She did this for three months. Y'all, that's a long time to be in daily anxiety. Three months, she has two choices. Either I keep hiding and eventually Eventually, the boy is found and killed or I can find a way to release him and keep him alive but there's one thing for sure she can't hide this baby anymore y'all ain't feeling me so tell your neighbor say neighbor you can't hide no more no more secrecy, no more confidentiality, no more isolation. What's been hidden in the dark is about to come to the light. And now she has a basket case. She has somehow managed to keep quiet for months and is beginning to make too much noise. And just to make her struggle in silence real, ladies and gentlemen, have you ever tried to keep a crying, screaming baby quiet for just a few minutes? Try for a few months with soldiers camped outside your door. And so now the timeline of chapter one and two would indicate that the decree went out before her pregnancy, which means she carried the baby nine months in hiding. She is in public hiding but not showing. She gave birth in hiding, nursed the baby in hiding. For one year, she has been in hiding. She's like so many people today whose reality is that they are struggling in silence. She is privately dealing with something she is internally struggling with, trying to keep something alive that seems to be like it's dying. Suffering in silence, ladies and gentlemen, is hiding from the public while you're dealing with the private hell. Who does she talk to? Who really understands? How do I keep managing and get past what I'm dealing with? She's keeping him hidden, ladies and gentlemen, because she loves him. 
but she's in a personal dichotomy. She can't let him go, but she can't keep him either. She's struggling of letting go of something she gave birth to and something she nursed. And so how do you deal with when something you gave birth to develops into a basket case? A career you gave birth to, a vision you gave birth to, preaching here, I am what you think I'm doing, a vision you gave birth birth to and you nursed it ladies and gentlemen what do you do when you've tried everything to keep it going only to see it slipping away out of your life this woman today is preaching to people who are struggling with keeping something alive but catch this church her first challenge is this hiding she's struggling in silence Dealing with a basket case that is eroding, declining, and coming to a head. But somehow she finds a way to focus her mind on an opportunity and not a death. She's like the psalm that said, who said, I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the salvation of the Lord. She's like Solomon who wrote, death and life are in the power of the tongue what's all going on with this woman is she manages to see an opportunity y'all say opportunity <laughs> the ancient Chinese did not write in words but the ancient Chinese wrote in characters our word crisis is written in two Chinese characters the first character means danger the second is a form of opportunity used in a time of op isolation called a change point and so the change point redirects the crisis into an opportunity to change. Y'all missed it. Her change point comes in her isolation when she begins create creatively and optimistically to look for opportunities in her crisis. She is just like some of us in life who got to where we are because we wouldn't stop until we found some way to make something work. Ladies and gentlemen, don't let your obstacles, no matter how severe, rob you of your optimism. Somehow this woman is still optimistic. Optimism doesn't need evidence, proof, guarantees, or assurances. Optimism only needs faith. If I have faith as a mustard seed, I can say to this mountain, be thou removed, and nothing shall be impossible for you. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes God puts you in crisis uh, so you can activate something deep inside of you that will never come alive while you're in the comfort and convenient of a life. Here's why. Fear sees obstacles. Faith searches for opportunities. When she thinks on an opportunity, she is now transitioned for giving up to now just releasing it. Catch this church. Fear gives up, but faith releases it into the hands of God. Here's the bad news, y'all. I got some bad news and good news. The bad news is she's been hiding in private. The praise report is she's been she's being held in providence. But she doesn't even know it. We don't see it until the end. But God was with her the entire time. Because what she gave birth to was to her child. But it was his chosen. Come here, let me walk you through the text. In other words, before she chose God, God had already chose her. That means that she was chosen for this crisis. Maybe God chose you for your crisis. Pause, rewind, and play. Maybe God chose you for your crisis because he knew that you would be the one who could handle it when you got through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. She is chosen to handle the chosen. <laughs> That's why people who envy you will never understand what you had to go through to get, get what you got. People who want what you got will never understand what you had to go through to get what you got. Y'all ain't feeling me. Tell your neighbor, I didn't get here cheap. You see what I got, but you didn't see my journey. Talk back with me. They want your success, but they can't handle your storms. They want your destination, but they can't travel your journey. They want your rhythm, but they don't want your blues. Can't just anyone handle the chosen. It takes a special person to handle the chosen. If you have a blessing in your life, it's because God chose you to handle the chosen. Couldn't 
nobody just raise anybody just raise Moses it took a special person to put Moses with because Moses would face death at the beginning of his life but he finds a woman named Jochebed whose name means to God be the glory. And that's some people you need in your life to handle you. Some people who through whatever you have to go through can tell you, listen, God's gonna get the glory. I don't know how he's gonna do it. I don't know when it's gonna happen. I don't know what it's gonna look like. But tell your neighbor, baby, God's gonna get the glory. I just had you preach to somebody you didn't even do it. Tell your neighbor, baby, God gonna get the glory. Calm down, quit acting a fool. Quit cussing people out. Quit getting on Facebook. Quit sharing with everybody you know. God's gonna get the glory because he chose you to handle the chosen. Somebody shout, I'm chose to handle the chosen. I showed up this morning to tell somebody that you still got an opportunity. And what God wants to show you, ladies and gentlemen, is he can do big things with your small moves. Y'all ain't feeling me today. He can do big things with your small rooms. Here's why God never runs out of ways to deliver. My grandmama would tell you right through here that God is a way maker. Just when you think it's over, God makes another way. And when that's over, God makes another way. And when that way falls out, God makes another way. That's why I don't trip on people who think they close doors in my face. The Bible says that God opens doors that no man can close. Is there anybody that can testify? I don't trip on what people do, on what people say. Go on and keep what you think you kept from me. I serve a God who's able to do all things. Do I have about 20 older people who can testify? No, pastor, I know he's a way maker. I graduated in the 40s, graduated in the 50s, graduated in the 60s. He keep on putting food on my table, keep on paying my bills, keep gas in my car. How many of you can testify I raised my children because he's a way maker? I just want to tell you that God has more opportunities than you have obstacles. Which means that all God wanted Jochebed to do was to not panic. And think of opportunities and make a move. H. Jackson Brown was an accomplished author of a book entitled Life's Little Instruction Book. <laughs> it was a book originally <clears throat> wrote to his college bound son named Adam. He wrote this little book to encourage his son, who he was releasing from home to go off to college. That book became a New York Times bestseller, God's Little Instruction Book. As a matter of fact, it was the first book to occupy the New York bestseller list in both hardback and paperback simultaneously. The book was just written to inspire his son on giving life and fulfillment in life in college. H. Jackson Brown died in 2021, but many of his quotes from the book are widely used today. One quote from the book was befitting for this woman today. Here's what he said. Nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity. Come here, y'all. Son in life, missing an opportunity can be costly and expensive. I wish I had some people like Jochebed who learn how to look at your opportunities and say it's going to cost me too much to miss this opportunity. Y'all ain't feeling me. Tell your neighbor, I ain't fumbling this bag. What God has given me is an opportunity to do something. Your opportunities have not run out because God never runs out of opportunities. How many of us have looked back over our lives and recognized that we missed an opportunity? How many times have you and I regretted that we should have done something but we didn't do it? How many times, I got some preachers in here, how many times have we remorsed that we should have stuck with something we gave up on? How many times many of us could be further along in life if we took advantage of an opportunity we missed? Here this woman is, she's not going to miss an opportunity. 
to do whatever she can to keep him alive and maybe something that seems to be fading in your life is an opportunity for you to see something different in it because sometimes God presents crisis for you to change your perspective in the crisis oftentimes before God changes the situation he changes you in the situation <clears throat> tell your neighbor she's hiding the baby but then number two not only the hiding the baby then we see the hand of God watch what she does she is determined to use what was meant for evil <laughs> to use it for good she does something audacious y'all the genocidal decree was to throw every firstborn male into the river the genocidal decree from Pharaoh was to throw every firstborn male into the river she sees an opportunity in her crisis and the first thing she does was throw her firstborn male y'all ain't feeling me the genocide was take every firstborn boy and put him in the river the first thing she does is throw him in the river ladies and gentlemen God will take the same thing the enemy plotted against you and make it work in your favor the river wasn't meant to kill him it was meant to save him the same river that Pharaoh meant to kill him God meant to save him am I preaching to anybody if y'all help me feel like it before I go eat my shrimp who can testify what God the devil meant for evil God turned around and used it the same plot they set against me the same scheme they use against me God got the glory the river I'm almost there <laughs> the river deacon takes him to Pharaoh's daughter y'all got time for the story who is moved to adopt him into the house of Pharaoh pastor watch this here's where God's providence takes over y'all she put the basket in the Nile River She put the basket in the Nile River. Sis, her only option was to put the basket in the Nile River. All right, let me help y'all because sometimes I'm slow. This is Egypt. The Nile River is still the world's most dangerous river. When Pharaoh told his soldiers in the genocide to throw them in the river, it's not so they would drown. In the river, there are the world's largest crocodiles, largest snakes, largest anacondas, man-eating freshwater fish the most swift powerful forces of current of any river I did my homework on earth the most deaths recorded annually in rivers are in the river Nile they have been putting babies in the Nile so that the monsters in the river are conditioned to eating human flesh and that's where she puts her baby. She places him in immediate danger. But the key is she does it by faith. Chapter 2 never says it's because of faith. So pastor, why do you say it's because of faith? 
chapter 2 doesn't say anything. Well, thank God that you are talking to a theologically, doctrinally sound preacher. Because when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, which calls out the hall of faith, it says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And verse 23 says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his mother and was not afraid of the king's decree she takes her faith ladies and gentlemen into her danger so that when I walk by faith I just believe that God is going to keep me am I preaching to 10 people who can help me get to the next point and say when you walk by faith God will just keep you in whatever That's why I'm not afraid of danger when danger comes. Because I take my faith into the danger. I don't fall apart. I don't come unglued. I don't lose it. I don't throw in the towel and give in and walk away. When danger comes, I take my faith. Are y'all tripping? Have you ever taken your faith into danger and said they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength? Have you ever taken your faith into your danger and said I can do all things? Through Christ who give me strength. I wish I had a church around here. Have you ever taken your faith into danger and said, wait a minute, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves us. Have you ever taken your faith in the danger and said no to God be the glory the devil is a liar if God brought me into it God will bring me out of it because of my faith. Here's why. This may snatch about five of y'all out y'all seat. Y'all don't want no teaching. <laughs> Here's why, Dave. She put him in the Nile River. Yeah. Deep. She put him in the water. It's water, but it's not Egypt's water. It's God's water. It's Egypt's decree, but it's God's water. The last time I checked in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God made water. Exodus chapter 17, God made water come out of a rock. Exodus chapter 14, God made the sea of water split in two. John chapter 2, God turns water into wine. Mark chapter 4, Jesus told the water in the waves to be still and remain calm. Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 16, Jesus walked on the water. Not only did he make the water, he made everything in the water. Genesis chapter 1, God said let the water teem with living creatures. Jonah chapter 1, God made a fish to swallow up Jonah for three days and three nights. Everything on it, in it, and under it, God made it. That means God controls everything that is a potential danger to your blessing. The most powerful and personal statement in the Bible is this, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. God, I release it, you direct it. Pause, rewind, and play. I release it, you direct it. God, I release it. God, you direct it. God, I release it. God, you direct it. I'm going to shout till I shout myself. God, you release it. Uh, you direct it. God, I give it up. God, you take it through. God, I give it to you. God, you handle it. That's how you handle a basket case. God, I release it. Sometimes you have to let something go. Boy, I wish I was in friendship right now. Sometimes you got to let something go. Here's the good news. If it comes back to you, it was yours in the first place. If it doesn't come back to I release it, you direct it. If it returns, God, it's your will. If it's removed, it's your will. Catch this, church. I know y'all tired, but I don't care. 
Catch this. Catch this, church. By faith, she makes a basket out of what the text says, bulrushes, papyrus reeds, and pitch. <laughs> when you put bulrushes and papyrus reeds and pitch, it is the equivalent of tar. She gets a basket and covers it with tar. <laughs> Y'all, the papyrus makes the basket float. Pitch makes it waterproof. And might I remind you, these are the same materials and techniques that Noah used. To make the ark stormproof. In Genesis chapter 6, matter of fact, verse 5 calls her basket an ark. Y'all, Noah's ark survived 40 days of storm and water because of papyrus and pitch. That means that whatever you give to God that he intends to preserve and give back to you will be storm proof. Am I preaching to anybody who can testify? Pastor, you talking about my testimony right there. Because I've given stuff to God, I found myself storm proof. It's not that I haven't been through this storm. I just survived the storm because I've been in the ark of God. Do I have any storm proof believers that can testify? The storm didn't take me out. It didn't take me under. It didn't cause me to fall apart. The storm only took me to the other side. I'm through, but hold on. I got a question. Y'all ain't ready for me. I got a question. Hey, Faust, how does the basket make it to the very spot? You got a whole Nile River. How does it make it to the very spot that Pharaoh's daughter was when? It could have gone in any direction. Y'all want to know why? Thank y'all. I love you. It's because God will take what could go in any direction and direct it for your favor. I believe I'm preaching to somebody who can testify. That problem that I had given to God could have gone any way. But God took it and made it work in my favor. The reality is the blessing that we enjoy today really could have gone in any direction. But God is directing your blessing, which means that God is active in the details and controls the outcome of your situation. So when she releases it to the water, she's releasing her basket case into the hands of God and many of you have released things into God's hands and you learned that God's got good hands. And he will preserve and protect what you release to him. I'm done. This is it. I quit. I'm sweating up my little pink shirt. I quit. <clears throat> this is it. We see the hiding of the baby. The hand of God. Then there is a hope for a return. The only thing she knew, ladies and gentlemen, was Egyptian women came to that place in the river to bathe. All she had was hope that the first he may be found and second when they found him they wouldn't remove him from the basket and throw him in the water. She didn't know what would happen but by faith she knew something would happen. That means she didn't know what, when, or how but she did know who. And when you release something to God the greatest tension can be the time between the release and the return. And the greatest builder of faith can be an unknown outcome over an extended period of time. Because she has to release and wait. Pharaoh's daughter spots the basket open. I'm done. And here's the baby crying. Tech says, has compassion on the baby. Pharaoh 
Pharaoh's daughter heard the baby and had the compassion. Y'all, her daddy is Pharaoh. Here's where we say, I'm done. I can't spend all day on this. Here's where we spend an, see an unlikely facilitator. Her daddy is the one behind the genocide with a decree to kill the firstborn of Hebrew males, which means she could be killed for disobeying her father. Why would she risk that move? The text says she has compassion on him. Y'all, come here. I'm done. Lord, hold your boy through here. That word for compassion is rachum. When it's used as a noun, it's rachamim. Both words are related to the Hebrew word rechem, which means womb. <laughs> Let's go home, y'all. She saw the baby and had rachamim, which is rechem. She had womb. Okay, okay, okay. Deke, I'm trying, man. She saw the baby. She had the emotions of the womb. Which means, when she saw the baby, a maternal instinct kicked in. No matter what her daddy said, her womb said something else. And the mother in her couldn't kill the child in him. Daddy is killing all the babies because he never gave birth to one. She's rescuing a baby that's supposed to be killed because she had a maternal instinct, which means that God already prepared a facilitator to be at that spot, at that moment, taking a bath at that time to receive what Yochabed had faith to release into the hands of God. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes when you release it to God, he will put it into the hands of an unlikely facilitator that he's already prepared to bless you they don't even know why they're blessing you but somehow God gave them a heart for your case Yochabed's daughter Miriam runs to Pharaoh's daughter and asks if she needs somebody to nurse the baby boy I'm getting happy too fast you can go on and get it started man go on and warm up the bus she gets the okay and runs to get his mother, Yochabed. And guess what happens? Pharaoh's daughter pays Yochabed to do what she was initially doing for free. She was just hiding in private. Now she's nursing him in the palace. She's just hiding in private, but now she's nursing him back in the palace. That means that God paid her back everything that she had to go through for the last year. I need you to help me preach this thing. Come on, boy. And tell your neighbor, say neighbor, God is about to pay you back for everything that you've been through. Come here, Job. What, Job? Tell him that I lost family and I lost friends and I lost finances. But if you read to the end of the story that God gave me back everything, is there anybody here that can testify that God will give you back the years that the the locusts have eaten. God will get you back. What the devil tried to take from you. Say yes. I need about 10 people who got back what you had to release to God. And all you can say now is to God be the glory. Y'all I'm done. But she's in the palace getting paid. I said she's paid in the palace by nursing her own son and they don't even know that she's his mother. What she went through for one year in hiding prepared her for what she would have to endure for years to come because she was hiding at home and broke but now she's hiding in the palace but at least she's getting paid. That means what she went through in private 
prepared her for what she needed in public. Her blessing is that she's hiding in plain sight. And what Pharaoh thinks is her blessing is actually Jochebed's blessing. I'm through, ladies and gentlemen. But sometimes the blessing is when people don't know your story. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you don't know my story. Some things are a testimony, but some things are between me and God. Is there anybody that can testify that I'm just like a yoke of bed? I'm hiding in plain sight. Don't nobody know what I've been through, but I'm nursing a blessing that God has given back to me. You got a blessing that nobody knows about, but you and the Lord. Don't quit on a basket case. Release it and give it back to God and watch God make ripples in the water and bring it back to you. I need about 20 people who can stand out of your seat and testify that God is bringing some stuff back into my life that I thought I lost. I had given up. I had almost quit. But thank God that he brought it back to my life. Say yes. Am I preaching to anybody who released it into the hands of God and God brought it back? That's because God wanted you to have a testimony. And here is the testimony of Yochebed to God be the glory to God be the glory is that your testimony to God be the glory throw your head back and say yes to God be the glory for what he's done Five your neighbor and say to God, be the glory for all that is done. Say yes. What has he done? One Friday night, he died. Didn't he die? Didn't he die? But Sunday morning, he got up to God. Be the glory. Somebody say I love him. That's why I praise him. That's why I lift him. That's why I shout. That's why I bless him. That's why I wave my hand. That's why I jump on my feet. To God be the glory for what he's done. I didn't have a way. Couldn't see my way out. Didn't know where to turn. But I put it in the hands of God. And when I put it in the hands of God, he made everything all right. Yes, he will. Turn to your neighbor, say neighbor. Didn't he do it? Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. Didn't he do it? I got a question for y'all. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Say yes, say yes.